died. I went in for routine laparoscopic surgery to have my gallbladder removed, and the surgeon accidentally sliced open a large vein on my liver. My entire chest cavity quickly filled with blood, making it impossible for them to see exactly where the bleeding was coming from, so they jammed some packing into the general area and closed me up. I woke up the next day blown up like a large balloon with almost half of my blood not flowing in my veins, but pooled in my chest and gut. The surgeon explained that this was the best option because the blood was pressing on my vital organs from the outside, and that if they'd drained the blood off, my blood pressure would have dropped to the point where I probably would have gone into shock and died. The internal bleeding took several days to stop completely, and it took almost three months before all of that blood in my gut had been absorbed back into my system, and I stopped looking and feeling like I was very pregnant. So there I was, lying in the hospital with my family putting on a brave face for me, but knowing how close it had been. Within a day or two of this disaster, my eldest son was at my bedside, and I again started trying to tell him about this way of imagining reality. Although he didn't give me the you're crazy look, bless him for that, he did confess later on that he presumed this was just the ravings of a man stoned on morphine. But that's not where our story about death ends. About two and a half years ago, I went on a trip to Australia. Up to that point in my adult life, I'd been reading mostly science fiction novels and Stephen King thrillers for my entertainment, and of course the never-ending stream of equipment manuals I was constantly pouring through as part of my day job as a composer and studio owner. But it was around this time that I decided to start reading more serious science books, and that's why the light reading I took with me to Australia was by physicist Michio Kaku, an eye-opening book called Hyperspace, a scientific odyssey through parallel universes, time warps, and the tenth dimension. Now, some people will tell you that my way of imagining reality is not the one that's currently taught in physics classes. But what kept happening for me as I read Kaku's book was that I could see ways that string theory and cosmology could quite easily be pasted onto what I had been thinking. More importantly, what that book showed me is that my way of imagining didn't go far enough because it only accounted for the universe we live in as a point in the seventh dimension. What, I reasoned, if the other universes Kaku was talking about were other points in the seventh dimension? My immediate inspiration was that this meant that the line, branch, fold pattern I had already imagined to get to the seventh dimension could be repeated a third time, leaving us with absolutely every possible expression of reality up there within the tenth dimension. But we're still talking about death here, so on my way back from Australia, I developed blood clots in my legs, a not uncommon problem for some, from sitting too long on the plane, which gradually migrated to my lungs. Feeling increasingly weak and short of breath in the weeks that followed, I finally got to the point where I couldn't even fall asleep because I kept having to gasp for breath, and I ended up in the hospital's cardiac surveillance ward for almost two weeks, hooked up to heart monitors in that lovely oxygen tube. For someone looking for a two-week holiday, I highly recommend the cardiac surveillance ward. Just make sure you're not in there with anything actually wrong with your heart. The nurses are friendly and work very hard to keep you calm and peaceful. The beds are comfortable, and once the blood thinners they put me on started to work and the clots in my lungs started to clear, I actually felt pretty good. 
So there I was with this recent insight about how my way of imagining reality could interface with leading edge theories about cosmology and the higher dimensions. I had my wife Gail bring in my laptop and during my two weeks stay in the hospital I wrote the first draft of my book. I've been asked more than once what drugs I was taking when I wrote all my unusual ideas down. Lots of people still think I'm kidding when I tell them I was on oxygen. During the following year I took that 90 page draft I'd written in the hospital and did a, little mo did a lot more reading about physics and cosmology. I was thrilled to discover that my way of blending quantum waves and branching timelines from 20 years before was in fact a real and recognized scientific theory, first advanced by Hugh Everett III and it was commonly known as the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. Everett went to his grave in 1982 largely unrecognized for the significance of his work, but over the past 10 years or so his theory has been increasingly embraced by the modern physics community. And while I was adding all this research into my book, I also created the audio soundtrack for an 11 minute animation I was envisioning. That, uh, uh, sorry, for an 11 minute animation I was envisioning that would more clearly illustrate those concepts I've been drawing on napkins in coffee shops 20 years before. The talented folks at O Media here in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada worked with me to create the visuals which are seen in the book and the animation and in the accompanying website which was launched at the end of June 2006. Within a few days, the website vaulted to popularity and this project became known all over the world. If anything, the project continues to gradually become more popular now because of the growing fascination people are having with the middle ground I'm trying to portray, a place where science and spirituality, physics and metaphysics can be shown to all be talking about the same thing. The website is currently getting 2 million hits a month and my little book, written as I lay in a hospital bed wondering if my heart was about to do me in, has been sold all over the world. Why has this project been so popular? Because it isn't just about physics, it's about creativity and inspiration and souls and memes, which are ideas that can be transmitted across time and space. It's about the place where information equals reality, a quantum physics idea that applies to many other things, which in our modern accelerated world of information means people with shared beliefs are connecting to each other more quickly than ever before. And with the increasing fascination these days over the Mayan calendar's predictions of the end of time happening in 2012, and futurists like Ray Kurzweil predicting a rapidly approaching singularity where humans and technology merge, the fact that this project began as a way of thinking about the end of the world adds new resonance. But to be clear, both Kurzweil and promoters of the Mayan calendar are not talking about an apocalypse. They're talking instead about a great leap forward in the way our conscious minds interface with space and time. So not an end of the world, but an end to the antiquated, antiquated ways of our current world. 20 years ago, I was a guy with an unusual idea in the middle of the Canadian prairies. Now I'm a guy with an idea that millions of other people around the world have seen and enjoyed and which more and more people are becoming convinced is not crazy at all and may just be the truth about the nature of our reality. Perhaps most amazingly, all of this happened with almost no advertising or promotion, just through the power of shared ideas in our modern hyper-connected world. How cool is that? I'd like to finish this uh, show off today with a song about hope for the future and it's called see no future. This is Rob Bryanson. Thanks from Imagining the Tenth Dimension. <laughs>